Welcome back. So part two, we're just going to continue our journey through various technologies we've used to manipulate DNA. Um, the next one is called polymerase chain reaction. And um, again, the name makes sense. It's kind of a chain reaction involving DNA polymerase. So the purpose of this is to make many copies of a gene of interest. And this is way faster and easier than getting lots of copies uh, by letting it replicate in living cells. So it's just a way to copy DNA quickly and efficiently. So how does it work? Well, what you do is you figure out what DNA do we wanna make a copy of, and you add that DNA um, to a little test tube thing, and then you add DNA primers. So here's some primers here. They're just these little segments of DNA complementary to some sequence in the target DNA molecule. And then you add nucleotides and the enzyme DNA polymerase. Um, you heat the strands ever so gently. And so, or you heat the sample ever so gently. And what happens is when you heat it, that added kinetic energy causes the hydrogen bonds holding the two halves of the DNA molecule um, to break. And so the two strands denature or fall apart. Okay. Then what you do is you cool the DNA down. When you cool the DNA down, that gives these primers an opportunity to bind. And then at that point, DNA polymerase is going to replicate the strand. So just like it would in a living cell, DNA polymerase is going to attach to this primer, use the nucleotides that you added to this test tube, and it's going to just broop, broop, and make a copy in the five prime to three prime direction. And where you at one point had one copy, now you have two copies. Then you simply repeat the process. You heat to separate, you cool to allow the primers to attach, um, and then you allow the DNA polymerase to do its thing. Your two strands become four. Repeat, four become eight, eight become 16, 16 become 32, and pretty soon you've got a lot of copies of this DNA. Interestingly, the DNA polymerase enzyme that they use um, actually came from a bacterial species that lives in a hot springs. And that is, the, that is how the DNA polymerase enzyme um, manages to survive when we are heating this sample up. Otherwise, it would denature just like any other enzyme and, and not be functional. But because it came from a, a hot springs bacteria, it can survive this. Um, why would we want to use this? Well, anytime you want lots of copies of DNA, you can use this. So an example would be in forensics. Um, oftentimes, a small amount of DNA could be found on a victim. So, um, for example, under the fingernails, they may scrape under the fingernails because if a victim is attacked, they might scratch their attacker and get a little bit of uh, get up some cells under their fingernails, but it's not much. And so this can be used to amplify that DNA, make a lot of copies of it so that it can be studied and analyzed. Um, we can study ancient life. So there have been some rare instances where we have found actual DNA from extinct species. So the woolly mammoth is a great example. The woolly mammoth lived during the ice age. That was, I think, like 10,000 years ago. That's nothing over the course of evolution. Um, and there are woolly mammoth carcasses that have just kind of, they died in the ice age. Um, and many parts of where they live, like Russia, is still frozen. So they died and they basically froze and have kind of been preserved. They've just been in the freezer for the last 10,000 years. And so they've actually found like fresh, not fresh, frozen mammoth carcasses um, that they've been able to use to try and, and get some DNA from, which is quite, pretty amazing. You can actually order, I believe, mammoth meat um, and, and like try a bite which I don't think it would taste very good after 10,000 years, but apparently that's a thing. It's kind of cool. Um, interestingly, there's been talk, if we can get a complete sample of DNA, could we ever clone the mammoth and bring it back? Whoa, Jurassic Park. Okay, um, we can use it in genetic medicine. So um, if we get a DNA sample, then we can use, you know, make a lot of copies of it that allows it to work with it to detect viruses or diagnose genetic disease or that kind of thing. Um, here's a relevant example for the current era, 2020, um, COVID testing. Um, PCR is actually used for COVID testing. So um, many of you students have probably maybe undergone this. So um, you give a sample either by spitting into a tube like this, or maybe they do a nasal swab where they shove this, this Q-tip up your nose and they kind of scrape the back of your throat. It's not a pleasant experience. Um, and they get a little bit of virus particles in uh, the saliva or a little bit 
in the from the back of your nasal uh, cavity and so we need to make a lot of copies of that and so um so here's how they do it um first problem though is since COVID 19 is an rna virus we have to convert that single-stranded rna into a double-stranded dna and we use an enzyme reverse transcriptase to do that then um, you may have heard of an rt pcr that stands for reverse transcription pcr test um, they basically use PCR to take your sample from your spit or your um, or your nasal swab, and then they amplify it. One copy becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, et cetera. Um, when they're actually replicating the DNA, though, um, and doing the PCR, they actually add a fluorescent probe to the mix. And as the DNA is copied, that fluorescent probe is sort of broken down and replaced by regular DNA. And in breaking down that probe, that releases a little bit of fluorescent protein into the solution. And so as the PCR makes more and more copies of this viral DNA, assuming it's present, um, then more and more fluorescent protein is released and then it starts to glow more and more. And that's how they know that you do in fact have viral DNA in your sample. So here's a really cool video that kind of walks through the whole process in um, a lot of detail if you're interested in checking that out. But yeah, PCR uh, has become very relevant in the year of the pandemic here. Um, the next technique I want to talk about is called gel electrophoresis. Um, <clears throat> the purpose of this one is to separate restriction fragments based on size. That's hmm, what? So here's kind of some images of what gel electrophoresis looks like um you basically uh there's a lab that we're going to do on this actually where you're going to heat up um this little agarose solution and um agarose is like the stuff at the bottom of a petri dish um and so you kind of melt it and then you pour it into a tray with a little plastic comb in there and then the plastic and then it solidifies much like jello basically it's like jello essentially um <clears throat> and then you kind of pull that plastic comb out and you're left with these little holes here so so how does this all play out well the first thing you do is if you're trying to like analyze some dna with this technique is you take that dna and you mix it with some restriction enzymes the restriction enzymes are going to recognize these black spots here are the restriction sites so it's going to recognize places where it can make a cut and it's going to cut the dna at specific locations and when it does it's going to cut that dna into different sized fragments and that's important different sized fragments then you take that dna and at this point it's just all in a in a vial a test tube or whatever so um it's not like you have a nice little pile of those fragments so you take that and you add this sort of bluish dye that you're seeing here and you add it to those little wells that you made in your gel which essentially is jello and so here you can see like this little tip of a pipette goes into that well and then you release the dna and you fill it up then you apply a voltage it turns out the DNA is slightly negatively charged. And so the DNA is going to migrate from this negative end by the wells to this positive end of the gel. So the DNA just kind of slowly migrates towards the positive end. But it turns out that that gel that it's in, the agarose gel, it's this really thick, goopy material for the DNA to go through, and it's hard to make it through. So if you're a little fragment, you're able to pass through pretty easily. But if you're a larger fragment, you're going to be slowed down a little bit. And so essentially, you get this separation of bands based on size, with the smallest bands being furthest away from the negative end and the largest bands being the closest. An analogy would be to imagine a mouse and an elephant racing through a really dense forest. The mouse can just go because it's small enough they can just cut right on through. The elephant is going to bang into tree branches and it just can't get through as quickly. Um, so when you're done, you get this unique pattern of bands. And again, these bands correlate to different sizes of restriction fragments. So this fragment is very small. This fragment is very large. So assume you play, loaded them in from the top. So um, so that's how you do it. Why would you want to? What does this tell us? Um, what application is DNA fingerprinting? Again, forensics. Um, certain stretches of DNA are highly variable across the population, which creates a unique genetic profile when cut by restriction enzymes. Um, this profile is called a DNA fingerprint. And so you can sort of take DNA from a crime scene and from each of your suspects, and you run it through this process. And if you take a look at the crime scene sample versus your three suspects, take a moment, 
and which suspect seems to match the same pattern of restriction fragments from the crime scene. And hopefully at this point you'd say, oh, suspect two, it's like the same. So yeah, if suspect two left his DNA at the crime scene, um, they're gonna end up having the same pattern of banding um, uh, when analyzed in this way. Um, the only issue is we oftentimes need a lot of copies of DNA to do this. So if we only find a small amount, how do we amplify it? Do you know? PCR, did you say PCR, polymerase chain reaction? Because you're right. Um, paternity testing is also used. So here's a mom, here's her kid, you know, maybe she's got a lot of money. So all three dads are claiming the kid is mine, um, or maybe for love, who knows. Um, and so the question is, who's the dad? Well, you can, again, do this analysis. Here's the mother, here's the child. And we know that each fragment had to come from one of the parents. So this fragment came from mom and this fragment came from mom, and this fragment, can't see it, but came from mom back there. And so then we need to figure out, well, where did the child get this fragment? Well, it could have been dad two or three. Um, how about these two fragments? Well, it looks like dad three is the only one who can account for all those fragments. So dad three, you're the lucky winner, love and affection of your child or mom's money, whichever, you know, maybe both. Um, so that's kind of an example of that. Um, next technique, Sequencing DNA. So trying to figure out the specific sequence of nucleotide bases in a DNA molecule. This one is very clever. So how do you do this? Well, you start by mixing many copies of the DNA strand of interest, a primer, regular nucleotides, DNA polymerase. So, so far, everything from this point to the left, this is exactly what you do with, um, with PCR, right? You're just sort of gonna replicate the DNA. But here's the clever part you use a very small amount of what are called di-deoxyribonucleotides. These lack that three prime OH group. You may recall when we looked at DNA replication, that OH group is essential for attaching a new nucleotide um, to this. And so if you have a di-deoxynucleotide, you're not gonna, it's gonna end DNA replication. You can't add to that. It's gonna end that process. So here's what you do. You have your many copies of this and you just let them replicate. And so if this is an A, we add a T. If this is an A, we add a T. If this is a C, we add a G. Um, but at some point as we're replicating this, since we have a lot of these regular nucleotides and a small amount of these, at some point we're gonna grab one of those dideoxynucleotides. It's gonna be random. So at this particular point, that DNA polymerase enzyme just happened to grab the dideoxy C. And what that means is it's going to end. We have no three prime OH group. We can't continue replication. So this strand is done. Well, then we, you know, since we have many copies of this, another one's going to be replicated. And let's just say it's this one. So we're randomly grabbing nucleotides, T, T. And so far we're grabbing random nucleotides, G, T, C, G, just getting re the regular nucleotides. But then we get to this one and all of a sudden, whoop, we just happen to grab the dideoxy G. And so boom, that gets ended. And so if you do this enough times and just let this thing go, um, eventually you're gonna get a strand that ends in every possible position. So now what you do is you wanna separate these strands by size and by golly, we just learned a way to do that. It's called gel electrophoresis. So we separate these strands by size, the smallest ones travel the furthest. And then there's little labels with each of these so we know um, they're color coded here, but we know which one. So, so the first strand, the very smallest strand ended with a T. And so that must mean that the original strand was an A. The next strand, next smallest ended with a C. So the original must have ended with a G because C is complementary to G. The next smallest is G. And so the next one must have been a C. And so you can kind of read this gel electrophoresis backwards and then do the complementary strand to figure out the original sequence of DNA. Very cool. By the way, this is also called the Sanger sequencing method, which has nothing to do with me. Um, by the way, um, I should point out, both gel electrophoresis and, and its role in this technique have, gel gels are a pain to work with, and so they have largely been replaced with other more efficient techniques, and now they do some bizarre laser thing that I don't even get it, but um, so it's a little out of date in terms of how they do this. Um, but I think it, it applies a lot of the principles that you've learned about, so I like to talk about that. Um, so I think I'm gonna pause there and then we'll continue um, to look at the implications of DNA sequencing um, to what's called the Human Genome Project in our next screencast.